We're continuing on in the book of Acts, or as I like to call it, the Acts of the Holy Spirit, working in a fledgling church to build and encourage and send them out to share the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We're in chapter 23 today, and I'd just like to preface that by this message by sharing that uh, in watching the news lately, it gets rather tedious and frustrating. So I've been going on to different sites such as uh, Christian Post or other Christian uh, websites of news that gives us a, a Christian perspective and perhaps a little more encouraging words. But even then, I get rather frustrated in hearing what's going on in the world. So I've been enjoying going to oh, funny websites, looking at jokes, or even websites with uh, crazy videos. For instance, I, I tuned in to one that was of a gentleman, a tree trimming that seemed to have gone from bad to worse situation. In the video, there was a large branch that was hanging precariously over his house. And so he sets a ladder up against the tree and goes and climbs it with his chainsaw ready to cut it down. He had a friend uh, wrap the branch with a rope and then pulled it back and wrapped it around himself so when the branch fell, it would fall away from the house. Well, neither one of them took into consideration several things. As the owner uh, cuts the branch, he didn't consider the law of gravity, which says a heavy object will fall to the ground, and it fell, and it knocked the ladder and himself off the, the ladder and down to the ground. The other gentleman hadn't considered uh, the full extent of the law of physics, which says an heavy object that is uh, in inertia of movement towards the ground and at the angle that he was holding the rope would pull him. And he flew through the air as the branch went down away from him. And lastly, neither considered Murphy's law, which says anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And sadly, things did go from bad to worse as the branch fell upon the house. <laughs> you might think our present circumstances seem to be going from bad to worse with the results of that may bring dismay or discouragement, even depression upon us, which are all responses to a situation of things that are out of our control, overpowering or or contrary to our best interests. Certainly those are all circumstances or feelings that Apostle Paul must have felt while he was in his situation. Things had gone from bad to worse. He had agreed to follow the Jewish leaders' advice, uh, the Jewish Christian leaders, that is. He agreed to go through the purif purification rites to demonstrate his devotion to God, but his enemies somehow even turned that into accusing him of sacrilege. And now he's being led and held by the authorities and alone is facing his accusers, the Supreme Court of Israel, the Sanhedrin. And while his friends are standing at a distance, helpless to intervene, he speaks to the Sanhedrin. He addresses them by saying, my brothers, acknowledging that we all, as brothers and sisters are seeking and worshiping a, a, a singular God that watches over all. And Paul begins his defense by stating that he had a clear conscience of fulfilling his duty to God at his best ability, in which he is immediately interrupted by the high priest Ananias, who breaks in and interrupts the, the order of the court and asks someone to slap Paul on the mouth. Now, Jewish law carefully protects the rights of defendants, presuming them innocent until proven guilty, so that the action was, was way out of line. And Paul calls the speaker of such terrible, uh, improper behavior a whitewashed wall, which means on the outside it looks very good as they sit there in their courtroom finery, but their spiritual character really is in terrible disrepair. We might wonder if Paul actually recognized that the speaker was who it was that would give such an unacceptable order. But two things are evident. One is once Paul recognizes it was the high priest, 
Paul immediately, humbly submits to Jewish law, which states, do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. And the second point is this. How well did Ananias reflect his love for God? You know, Paul might not have recognized Ananias because he did not act as a high priest should. Jesus' own words speak of his desire that we would reflect upon our own actions when he says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. John 13, 35. In other words, do our actions represent the Christ as Lord of our lives? Well, after this shocking interruption, Paul again begins his defense, but he begins with a different tact this time, Remind, which reminds me of a friend who said once that she was in her final stages of acquiring her, her doctoral degree. She was sitting facing a committee of, of very esteemed professors as she was defending her doctoral dissertation. Beforehand, she was advised that should the committee begin arguing among themselves, do not interrupt them. Let them fight your battle amongst themselves. Well, they did begin arguing, and she kept quiet. And she found the whole process much, much easier as they verbally sparred amongst themselves. And in the end of that discussion, her dis dissertation was approved. Well, Paul noticed the Sanhedrin was made up of two clashing parties. There were the Sadducees, who did not believe in the hereafter, nor of angels and demons, and the Pharisees, who acknowledged all of those things. So Paul restates his defense by noting that he is a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. And then he says, I stand on trial because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead, from verse 6. In one sense, Paul is, is stating that he was really being the most consistent Pharisee of them all. He was fully believing in and followed in the resurrection from the dead, the death of the Messiah who has already come, and he is his servant. <laughs> and that's when the fight began. Paul's statement pitted the two factions against one another. There was an uproar. It says they began standing up and arguing vigorously. The dispute stopped their examination of Paul as they started arguing amongst themselves. And at one point, it became so violent that there was concern for Paul's welfare and he, that he would literally be torn to pieces. And so the Commodore commander, I should say, ordered the troops to take Paul out by force and bring him back to the barracks. Things went from bad to worse, and now they had gotten to their very worst. It was obvious by the Sadducees, Pharisees infighting that the issue was a religious one. And the Pharisees had even said, we find nothing wrong with this man. What if a spirit or an angel had spoken to him? From verse 9. And with that, Paul would have, would have hoped, I would think, that the Roman commander would see that he had broken no laws, no laws deserving of arrest or a trial, and that he would be released. But now with the, the trial canceled and not having been found innocent or guilty, and instead of his freedom, he's being led back to sit behind bars. That would have been the lowest point for me, and I would suppose for Paul as well. One thing Paul has going for him, however, during this point is a history of God stepping into his life. So Paul's ears, I believe, are, are open to God's voice, even though there are tough situations. And that night... God breaks in through a vision in verse 11, which I think is pivotal in the whole passage. The following night, the Lord stands near Paul and said, Take courage. 
as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify in Rome. Wow. Those words are key for Paul's and I believe even for our faithful response when things go from bad to worse. First, it states that the Lord stood near to Paul. God steps in reminding Paul that in this and all times that he is there with him. I will never leave nor forsake you, scripture says in Matthew 28, 20. And another time Jesus is speaking about sending the Holy Spirit so that we are not alone as he says, I will not leave you as orphans, in John chapter 14. And I have to admit, even as an adult, when my parents passed away, it hit me that I'm now an orphan. I'm on my own. And without my mom and my father's encouragement that was always there throughout my life to back me up. Hmm. It was a hard feeling. But God reminds us now that we are never alone. He will not leave us to deal with life by ourselves. And before leaving them, Jesus encouraged the disciples with these words. But my, be very truly, I tell you this. It is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if he, I will go, I will send him to you. In John 16, 7. Never think that God has left you. He loves you too much and has demonstrated it by sending his son, his only son, Jesus Christ, for your salvation and the Holy Spirit to encourage and lift us up so that we reach our goal of being with the Lord for all eternity. Secondly, the Lord said, take courage. Courage comes with God's pre- when God's presence is certain. Love casts out all fear, Scripture says in 1 John chapter 4, as a reminder of the broadness, the depth, the fullness of God's love for you, which gives assurance that he has and always will do what will bring you into his holy, eternal presence. Such love is an assurance that what God prayed for and on our behalf will be done when he said in John chapter 17, Father, Protect them by the power of your name. Now, I honestly do not believe that Paul was immune from the emotions when things go from bad to worse that we feel. I presume he went through the times of despair and questioning. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. shared a nugget of wisdom in such times. We must build dikes of courage to hold back the flood of fear. It was over time that Paul built a dike of faith as he watched for and saw God's hand of prayers answers in circumstances being miraculously resolved and of personal visitations from the Lord. Faith grows when you look for uh, the hand of God in your midst, for it will be there. Through the many obstacles and struggles Paul learned that he need not fear. He knew God was watching over him always. And that fear just gets in the way of seeing how God will work out the details of this circumstance as well. So Paul was able to trust his future to the Lord, the Lord's perfect care. And lastly, point is that Paul realized that God had plans for his life. God had new marching orders for him. God was saying, don't give up. Don't get depressed. That's only going to give in to Satan's will of making you ineffective and without hope. I'm using these circumstances to deliver you to Rome, where you can have an audience that you would never have imagined nor have been able to accomplish on your own. Paul had had done great work in the mission field to the Gentiles, but God had sights for a different audience now. While uh, while in Rome, Paul concludes in a letter to the Philippi church these, these things. All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong 
to Caesar's household. It was through Paul's arrest and eventual trial in Rome that he was able to present the gospel message into the house of the highest authority of the Roman Empire, Caesar's home. Wow. That meant a great deal to Paul during the delays and angst awaiting what comes next. He'll be in jail for two more years awaiting his trip on to Rome. But God's encouragement to Paul remains, as F.F. Bruce said, as he calls Paul a master of events rather than their victim. Take courage. God is working through his faithful church, even today. Don't look at the storm-filled waters and the blowing winds. Look to the Lord Jesus Christ, whose outreached hand is there to lift you up and his spirit that enables you to be courageous followers to do his good work. Go, take courage, and God bless you.